Rutgers University professor of vaccinology, Shabir Mahdi, believes Africa could have a COVID-19 vaccine in the first quarter of next year. And uh, the first results could be in as early as before the end of this year. That is, if human trials now underway in the country show the desired outcomes. The experimental vaccine is also being tested on humans in Brazil. Now, this week, Russian scientists announced that they were on the brink of developing the world's first coronavirus vaccine after completing tests on volunteers. This is Professor Shabir Mahdi now joining us uh, to give us some insight into this idea. Prof, good evening and thank you for your time. We do know that globally 19 experimental COVID-19 vaccines are in the human trial phase. Uh, two are on the final, uh, that is the phase three uh, of, 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 of the trials. But uh, we're hearing Russia saying, well, we're well ahead now. We are ready with the vaccine. Is Russia really ready to give us the first uh, COVID-19 vaccine? So good evening to you. So uh, just a step back. So in fact, right now, there's 29 vaccines that are now in human trials, of which three are in phase three studies. As to whether Russia is ready to give us a COVID-19 vaccine or not, uh, only time will tell. Unfortunately, uh, just uh, set putting things out in the media is not un it's unhelpful in terms of understanding where exactly we are, uh, including the Russians in terms of where they are with the clinical development of the vac vaccine. Uh, it would be great if Russia can produce a vaccine tomorrow, but the clinical development of these vaccines takes at the minimum on a very expedited pathway between 12 and 18 months. Uh, to date, I haven't seen any data from the Russian vaccine candidates, so it's really uh, premature to indicate, uh, to suggest that there is a vaccine that might be available to uh, the world in the next few months. Many people in South Africa wondering whether or not we will be able, at least by the end of this year, to have a vaccine so that 2021 can return to normal. Should they pin their hopes uh, on the study and the trials that you're conducting right now that we will have that? Yeah, so unfortunately not. Uh, and the reason why I say unfortunately not is that at the earliest, we might have an answer by the end of this year as to whether the vaccine that's been evaluated in South Africa works or not. Uh, but beyond that, it's an issue of actually uh, there being adequate capacity to manufacture vaccine at scale. And vaccines are not something that can just be sort of rolled out uh, at a manufacturing plant. There needs to be an investment in terms of the manufacturing facilities. And then we are looking at uh, manufacturing facilities that are going to be able to develop vaccines in a billions of doses, uh, which simply is not going to happen overnight. So even if the South African vaccine study comes up with a positive finding together with a study that's currently underway in the United Kingdom as well as in Brazil with the same vaccine candidate, uh, AstraZeneca, which is a company that now owns the rights to the vaccine, would then need to basically start producing a vaccine at scale. Uh, and unfortunately, as we all know, there's a huge demand for vaccines that are yet to be developed. Uh, so there's a number of initiatives underway, including by the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, known as COVAX, which is trying to streamline the process in which especially low middle income countries such as South Africa would be able to gain at least a fair share of the vaccine that becomes available, hopefully during the course of next year. Now. We know you've mentioned now three, uh, at least, uh, that you, you know. You're saying 29 uh, globally experimental COVID-19 vaccines are in the human trial phase and three are in the final uh, stages. I know of two. I know of China's uh, Sinopharm and I know of the University of Oxford. Would it help South Africa at all to tie up with the work that they have already done uh, in maybe fast-tracking uh, this process? Yeah, so I think... Um Unlike what many people in South Africa and the African continent actually believe, that companies are rushing to Africa to do vaccine studies, that's anything but the truth. In fact, there's very little incentive on the part of companies to come to Africa to do studies on COVID-19 vaccines, because these are studies that need to be done throughout the world. So we actually challenged in terms of not enough vaccine studies being done on the African context. And we would most certainly want to be involved in more vaccine studies on COVID-19 so that most importantly, we can get an understanding in terms of how these vaccines work in our local population. A vaccine that works in the United Kingdom and a vaccine that works in the United States doesn't necessarily mean the vaccine would work as effectively in a different context, such as an African context, where the fabric of society and the fabric of our communities are completely different. So it's absolutely essential for us to try to get convinced companies, in fact, 
to do some early studies in our own uh, countries so that we can at an early stage generate evidence in terms of the value of these vaccines and then make a case as to why these vaccines should be introduced into our countries at an early stage rather than after the pandemic has passed us. Yeah. Given the context of this vaccine and, and how, how little we know about it and how new information keeps coming up every single uh, day, literally, uh, on how this is behaving inside a human body, wh where do we stand in terms of a, 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 a South Africa that is living with this pandemic? How will it develop? I mean, the more people get it, will more people then build resistance? We will be able to, to fight it naturally. How, how is it going to progress? Yeah, so unfortunately, that's a very uncertain scientific question at the moment. And the reason for that is what has uh, emerged over the past few weeks is that what has been shown is that individuals that have been naturally infected, and especially if they've had a mild illness or they were asymptomatic, which makes up the majority of people, 95% of people that are infected with a virus would have a mild illness or would be asymptomatic, they unfortunately don't seem to be uh, mounting a good immune response. There seems to be very rapid waning of the immune response, especially when we just look at antibody over a period of one month. So uh, unlike people with severe disease, their antibody seems to be lasting for at least two to three months. Now, although the antibody itself is not the only measure as to whether there is immunity or not, it is at least a signal. And right now, it's fairly pessimistic in that there is a suggestion that natural infection might not induce a robust immune response which might not confer long-term immunity, uh, which means that we might have large percentage of the population being susceptible to developing a reinfection as well, as well as COVID-19, although subsequent infections are more likely to be less severe. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem uh, from the current evidence that herd, what we call herd immunity, where a sufficient percentage of the population develops immunity, which interrupts the transmission of the virus, it doesn't seem that that is necessarily going to emerge or evolve yeah. just with natural infection. That is very important, Prof, because that means somebody who's had the virus and recovered, this is not the time to drop the ball and drop your guard. Actually, you must continue with the non-pharmacological uh, uh, protocols that are in place to, to prevent transmission. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I think what we also need to understand is that there's a difference between developing COVID-19 and being infected with a virus and being possibly able to transmit the virus. So even after you develop an immune response, you might be protected against developing the disease, COVID-19, but you're not, might, you might not necessarily be protected in being infected and transmitting the virus, although it's probably less likely, but that risk still exists. So irrespective of whether people have been infected or not in the past, that's not the passport, not to take the necessary precautions, both to protect yourself from becoming reinfected, as well as to reduce the chances of you being responsible for infecting others. So adhering to the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the physical distancing, avoiding mass gatherings, wearing a face mask is absolutely essential and remains essential until we get a better understanding as to what's required to be able to interrupt the transmission of the virus, or at least to break the back of this pandemic, which is possibly a vaccine. So this new normal then that we are living under and seeing people with masks and the sanitizing of hands when you go into this shop, coming out of that shop, sanitize, you go into that shop, coming out of, it, it's just, it, it, it's, it's the new normal that we are now getting used to. Is that something that people must just learn to live with? And this is something we're going to live with uh, through 2021 as well. Oh, well, most certainly. So what we're experiencing right now in South Africa and what many other countries have experienced is probably only the first wave of an outbreak of what are probably going to be multiple outbreaks. Uh, whether the second wave of the outbreak is going to be as severe as the first or less severe, it really, again, probably depends on the behavior of people in terms of how they uh, sort of try to control the rate of transmission of the virus. But in all likelihood, all of the majority of epidemiologists and scientists I do believe that there's going to be multiple waves of outbreaks of COVID-19, at least for the next uh, two years, at least through the end of 2021, if not into 2022. And the only thing that might interrupt that is if we do have a vaccine that becomes available sooner. Professor Bimadi, I appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us, Professor of Vaccinology at the University of Vatuswan.